Hello and welcome to the Cybers webinar series. I'm Tina Lee, Cybers' User Engagement Officer. Today's webinar is on RNA-seq analysis using Callisto in Cybers, presented by Jason Williams. For those of you who are new to Cybers, we are a cyber infrastructure project funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation. We offer these free webinars to fulfill a key part of our mission, which is to train scientists on how to use Cybers and its computational resources. First, we'll take care of some light housekeeping and then start the webinar. Today's presentation is approximately 30 minutes with time for questions and answers at the end. Please mute your audio, but do open the Zoom chat window where you can type questions for Jason. He has told me that he is a multi multitasker, master multitasker, and may be able to answer your questions during his presentation or will certainly answer them after he's done. The webinar video recording will be posted on our website by Monday for you to review at any time, and you can find the Callisto tutorial in the Cybers Learning Center. I'll also post that link in the chat. Besides these webinars, Cybers offers other virtual training events, and all of our learning materials are online. So watch your inbox for information about our upcoming learning events, intro and advanced container camp, and foundational open science skills, which we'll offer this spring. And then visit our website for more resources that you can use to learn and teach using Cybers. And now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter. Jason Williams is the Assistant Director for External Collaborations at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories DNA Learning Center in New York. That's one of our uh, collaborator institutions. As Cybers' lead for education, outreach, and training, Jason is a trainer of trainers and has trained literally thousands of students, teachers, and researchers in bioinformatics, data science, and molecular biology. I've worked with Jason for many years and will assure you that he is one of those colleagues that you are glad to have around because he knows when and how to say just the right thing. Sometimes that may even be in Mandarin Chinese, but it lets everyone know that he's on top of a situation and to have no fear. So welcome, Jason. All right, thanks. You set the bar so high. I'm just gonna totally <laughs> come in under the bar. It's Friday, everybody. So welcome and thank you so much for joining. Uh, as Tina said, we will try to keep uh, we will try to keep track of questions in the chat and do our best. Tina also posted, and you might have gotten a reminder in your email to a link where there's a detailed tutorial that I'm gonna be following and I'll pull up later. And so um, you know, if you're really ambitious, you might have tried it and gotten all the way through because the workflow is fairly straightforward. But if you didn't have a chance, you might want to do that after and then follow up for questions. We'll be posting this and you can reach out to me and I'll, I'll do my best to help. Um, obviously, RNA-seq is a popular topic. We have lots of folks in the room and even more that registered probably to watch after. So uh, I hope to give you a bit of an introduction. Um, so the goals for this webinar is I'm going to give you a broad overview of some RNA-seq practices you might want to think about if you're doing this experiment. Um, we are going to focus on a single workflow for RNA-seq, uh, this Callisto Sleuth workflow. And um, we're talking about bulk RNA-seq and not single cell, although you can actually use Callisto and Sleuth workflow for single cell. I'm not dealing with that today. We've only got 30 minutes. And so I just want to make sure that I've helped you to identify some tools and resources that get you analyzing your data as soon as possible. Um, so all of the materials, and I'll refer to this later at learning.cybers.org, and I'll come back and I'll show you that. Um, I'm going to spend roughly 15 minutes on the slides and then 15 minutes on, uh, well, maybe a little bit less, we'll see, on actually showing you the workflow, a little bit of the hands-on and a little bit of the visualizations you can do, um, and just to try to balance that out. Um, we've only got a half hour, um, so I'm limited in what I can do. So I'm going to focus on that practical software and data hygiene. We're going to get just a few key concepts that you need to know about. Uh, I could do a cooking demo, although we're not set up for that. that. Those are things I can do in a half hour. I cannot tell you everything you need to know about RNA-seq. I can't get into things like sword juggling. Um, that would take a lot more than half hours. I just want to have realistic expectations that you know this is the material we're going to try to cover. Okay, um, there are also some compromises. And um, in an ideal thing, we'd have days to go over this. We would, you know, be doing this on your own computer, on your own cluster. But obviously, some things have to be, um, you know, uh, just sort of preset for us in order for this to work. So one, we happen to be using example data, and they happen to be from eukaryotic model organisms. Um, 
so we couldn't do a, do a bring your own data to half hour webinar. Um, we're working with, like I said, just a single workflow, but it's, uh, it's not that it's just simple, it's really powerful and accurate. And so it's, it's really a great workflow. All the tools and everything we've done are on cyber. So it's not a situation where you need to install these tools, although you absolutely can and I encourage you to, um, but maybe you'll also see some of the advantages of running this stuff on cybers. Um, at the end, it terminates using an R Shiny app, and actually, we, well, to even get there, you need to use R Studio. But everything is an R Markdown notebook. So even if you've never used R, you'll be able to follow it along. And I'd argue, even if you've, you've never used R, you could modify that notebook and, and try to get started analyzing your data. But if you do have some familiarity with R, then you'll be even further along. Okay, so um, those are the two topics. That's how it breaks it down. Let me keep moving. Um, but uh, otherwise we won't get into the, the meat of it. So intro to bulk RNA-seq. Um, there are two things that I recommend that you read if you haven't. One of them is from 2016, but is really nice. So I still keep it on the slide. And the other one is, is a little bit more recent. So the 2016 paper, and again, these will be posted and you can screenshot if you, you need any of this, but you can Google it now. Is a survey for best practices of RNA-seq data analysis, and that's by Anna Conessa et al. in Genome Biology. And there's a more recent one, which is RNA-seq, the teenage years, and that is by Rory Stark et al., uh, and that was in Nature Reviews Genetics in 2019. If you can only read, if you only have time to read, you know, two things to sort of get yourself into the world of RNA-seq, um, those would be two places I start. I would start. It's, it's really nice and relevant data. Um, <clears throat> And I already see a first question, <laughs> which I'll stop and answer, but I don't know how often I can do it, which is the question is like, uh, do, what's your take on the need to verify RNA-seq results with qPCR? When do you think it's needed? It's not. The answer is it's not needed. <laughs> and let me tie that question into what I wanted to say, which is um, while single cell RNA-seq is still really, um, there's still quite a number of things that are happening. I'm not saying that bulk RNA-seq is, is dead or anything, but the tool set and the approaches and a lot of the ways of doing RNA-seq um, are fairly, I think, converged on a fairly stable set of tools that are more or less going to give you very similar results. And I would encourage you when you're doing an RNA-seq experiment to actually try more than one pipeline if you have the time and if it, you know, if it suits you to, to, to try to see, there will always be some variation. But as Carl mentions um, to the comment by uh, Dr. Washington, um, reviewers will often say, oh, you should, have, you should have verified it with qPCR. And really the technologies are stable enough and reliable enough that that's absolutely not necessary. If you have an RNA-seq result, you can trust it. Um, for the most part. I think it, it might be valuable as a student exercise just to do the qPCR. Let's say you were working with somebody else's data, then I might do it as an exercise, but it's not needed. Um, so back to uh, the main flow here. Uh, yes, please read those papers if you have a chance. They give you a great overview. Um, my slide, look, well, the highlighting has moved a little bit, but um, the, the, the takeaway from that Canessa paper is that RNA-seq, RNA there's no single pipeline that can be used in all cases. And they give, um, if you look about when RNA-seq started to, the very first RNA-seq, the thing that could be called RNA-seq, although it wasn't necessarily called RNA-seq, um, is uh, back in around 2000, um, 2008. Uh, so it's, we're now, in a, we're now we've got more than 10 years experience in doing RNA-seq. Uh, and, and that was already at a time when we were pretty sophisticated with microarrays. So we're pretty stable and this technology is not in the experimental days, even five years ago that um, I think you would have had a lot more, oh, should we do this many replicates and should we do this and do that? I think a lot of these things are um, fairly comfortable answers to many questions about what you wanna do. Um, the, the paper there gives some ideas of here are various types of pipelines. I'm not going to read this to you. I'm just going to point out, look for that figure and go through it to get an idea of there are different things. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about experimental design and sequencing design and quality control. But I, I want you to know there's some options, but it's a pretty stable menu of options that you can think about and feel pretty confident about the choices that you make. Um, so the very, very first thing about uh, RNA-seq that happens before analyzing any data is actually designing your experiment. And if you don't think about it, you're, you're literally taking your money and time and shoveling it into uh, the furnace. Uh, and again, this is a quote that's directly stolen from that paper. I mean, quoted and cited properly. 
uh, a crucial requisite prerequisite is that um, the data generated have the power or have the potential to answer the biological questions of interest. I'm going to stop sharing and come back because I like to mix things up and you can see my face in bigger. I don't know if that helps convey the seriousness of um, when you actually do your RNA-seq experiment, you need to really understand what are the effects that you think are going to happen in the system. Um, it comes down to if you're, if you're generating a million reads, 10 million reads, 100 million reads, all of those, you know, um, depending on how many reads you're generating and the amount of data that you're collecting, um, effects that are really small and tiny, um, let's say a very rarely expressed uh, transcript that's at a very low level in, 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 you know, in, even in your normal versus like a knockout or CRISPR, you know, CRISPR knockout or whatever, um, that's going to be harder to detect versus something that's going to give, give a wild phenotype and give really, really, uh, you know, threefold, fivefold differences in expression. And so you need to consult and think through and even work with a statistician and, and many universities will have a statistical consulting service in order to make sure that your uh, experiment is sufficiently powered, that when you do the statistical analysis, you can actually get a result. Um, so this is um, uh, that summarized in a table, um, basically when you're asking the questions of how many replicates. Now this is a little bit older and um, I would say that uh, you could in some cases deal with fewer, uh, fewer than, you know, over here at the end, it says 10 replicates. And uh, there are some tricks that the, the new technologies give you that you may get away with, uh, with doing less, but it's absolutely impossible to publish something with less than three replicates. And then you can decide, uh, you know, if you've got uh, things again, continue to increase in price and you've got a little bit of money and you think the effect is going to be um, something you want to, uh, you know, pick up, you can, go ahead and decide that you want to do more replicates. Uh, a really good thing is if you can spend somebody else's money, and I mean not spend NSF or NIH money, but I mean if you can find uh, other papers where people have done uh, RNA-seq experiments in similar um, conditions or similar systems, that may also give you a clue if they were happy with their experimental design and, and picked up certain things, that might be something that you want to uh, pay attention to. Uh, and to answer Carl's question, I'm talking here, uh, I'm often talking about biological replicates. Uh, technical replicates, again, are generally not, um, uh, the, the, the biological variation that you're gonna get in your RNA-seq experiment is gonna be way more in general now. Again, the technologies are so good than any kind of rep, um, effects that you're gonna see from your technical replicates. One thing that I might not mention enough, so I'll say it here, is that there are such a thing as batch effects, um, which, which goes into how and where those things are sequenced, uh, that you need to pay attention to that uh, and account for that and subtract those things. But by and large, I mean here, biological replicates and um, the technical variation is not going to be a major player in, um, in most circumstances. And there are controls that you can do like spike-ins. You have to worry about batch effects, uh, Antonio. You have to think about what are the, the appropriate controls? But if you use those appropriate controls, you really shouldn't be seeing that too much um, because the, the, again, the, the technologies are pretty good. So um, the, the, the takeaway from that message is to um, ask and, and whether collaborators at your institution or colleagues and get a little bit of help in designing your experiment, especially if you haven't done it before. And then also see, are there other um, are there other um, experiments that are maybe deposited on sequence read archive that are, are relevant to your organism, your system? And um, in some cases, you may do a pilot experiment, and you know that may that may let you know that you you need to actually do a larger experiment. Um, then, of course, I'm I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. These things are covered in the any of any of those papers that I referenced, um, but. Uh, what you need to consider is the quality of the materials, uh, ideally, hopefully using things that are, are fresh tissues that are uh, immediately frozen in nitrogen. Um, the experimental you know, conditions and time con constraints, how many uh, time points and treatments are you collecting? Are you looking for messenger RNA or small um, RNAs, microRNAs? Are you going to do ribosomal depletion? Um, usually you are going to do that, but in some cases, maybe you're, you're looking for also, 
um, poly A enrichment, um, but there may be other cases where you're looking at different types of RNA species. So you, you, you need to think through these things, but they're all very nicely spelled out. And finally, you're probably going to do some kind of QC on your um, analysis using something like a bioanalyzer or qubit, um, because basically you need to make sure that you're inputting high quality RNA into the system. If you have a low RIN with the RNA integrity number, um, then there's no way you're going to get good signal. And if you don't do depletion or you don't select, you'll spend most of your money sequencing ribosomal RNA. Um, Kathy asked the question about um, what about biases? What happens, let's, let me, for example, if I'm if understanding your question, if you sequence, if you do a lot of replicates um, in one sample and you can't do as many replicates in the other samples, that can be corrected for statistically quite a bit. But again, that's where you're going to need to talk to your statistician ahead of time to, to, to uh, say that, right? Um, you may be able to go a little bit lower sampling and number of replicates on your controls and your mock data versus um, where you are actually doing a treatment. Okay, um, you're going to have to think about the type of reads that you're collecting. Most people will be doing short read Illumina data still, but obviously if you're doing, if you're looking for new isoforms, something like PacBio or now even Nanopore are going to allow you to, to do that. And that's where also you're going to get some controls with spike in standards. Uh, and also very often now with pricing paired end sequencing, but here's where you might do a pilot experiment with single end sequencing and with a little bit lower coverage just to sort of see because you have no idea what the effect size might be and you want to figure out in a second experiment that. So those are some examples. Um, so I mentioned all of these things, getting rid of the RNA, thinking about um, the strandedness and the you know, paired end or single end, and then thinking about batch effects, doing things in parallel, and have samples that are processed at random with, a, with some spike in controls. Okay, I need to move it along because we are already at 1.17 uh, in, in my time. So uh, this message is only to say, uh, only to get, get you thinking that um, how many RNA-seq alignment softwares work, uh, I'm just gonna assume that you kind of have this idea that we take RNA-seq reads and then we quantify them against um, a genome, or at least that's how previous approaches like top hat and cufflinks work. Those old versions of top hat and cufflinks, which you should no, no longer be using as, as repeatedly asked by their authors, although now the, the newer versions are okay. Um, these align to a reference genome. They use a strategy reference uh, annotation guided assembly. Um, and those are slower methods, and there's there's many modern ones that are that still work in a similar way, but that are um, more efficient. So um, the Callista workflow, which we're going to talk mention now for the first time, is is really talking about is published um, back in uh, 2016, and uh, with the first there was a bio, there was an archive paper, not bioarchive, which introduced this concept of pseudo alignment which I don't have as much time to get into as I would have loved to. Um, so you'll have to read the paper. But the idea is, let me try to explain it in the two slides that I have as simply as I can, that if you have a transcript, a real transcript here uh, in black, let's say that that transcript in A is a real gene that you have annotated somewhere. And then you have your reads and the colors of the reads are this pink and blue and green. Um, what pseudo alignment does, the, the main thing of this idea of Callisto and pseudo alignment is that rather than align to a genome, you align to a transcriptome. And as you know, the genome is full of junk. Um, I'm using that in a very um, loose handed way. But there's a lot of things in the genome that aren't um, transcribed RNAs that we care about, perhaps. And, and so if you just search the transcriptome, you're narrowing your search space. And what Callisto does is it asks the question, could a particular read or set of reads, been gen could, could it have been generated by a transcript? And what it does is if, if, it, if it starts matching a transcript, uh, or rather it starts matching a read to a transcript and that read stops matching, it just stops counting it and says, well, this could never have been generated um, this, from this, from this uh, transcript, throw it away. Let me try to simplify that. Um, in the traditional alignment of RNA-seq, what you would do is you would try to align a, uh, an Illumina read, let's say, to a genome. And you'd 
check off every single base pair, A, C, T, G. Is it match, didn't match, match, didn't match, didn't match, didn't match. And so the insight of pseudo alignment is we don't need to match every single nucleotide and every single read to every single uh, possible place in the genome. We just need to figure out, could a read have come from a transcript? If it could have come from there, then you know, put it in that bucket. If it couldn't have been generated from there, then don't count it as being from that transcript. I'm simplifying a lot, but that's kind of one of the key insights there. So let me go back and then see if I can just tie that in a little bit of a bow. Um, the, the effect of doing this speeds up the process so much and it's really, really efficient and gives you this really simple workflow that works um, in a fraction of the time. Um, this is the slide that I, if I go in a little bit deeper, um, you can probably read this, especially if you're a native English speaker, but you'll notice that um, you know, if I read it aloud, I couldn't believe that I could actually understand what I was reading using the incredible power of the human mind, according to research at Cambridge University. Uh, it turns out that in, in English, and I'm sure many other um, alphabet-based languages, as long as the first letter and the last letter of a word is correct, then you could actually read the words with almost no problem, right? And so the point here is, is that it, just by a few characteristics of the word, we can actually match the word and count the word. And so Callisto throws away that unnecessary information and then just uses the information that's absolutely the minimum needed. And so it speeds up the process of counting. And, and compared to the um, uh, original methods, uh, here you see, um, well, in time, 2,500 minutes, you know, top hat two versus uh, less than a minute, you know, three minutes or four minutes to do Callisto. So it's fast and it's also very accurate. Um, I'm not going to go through exactly showing, um, you know, talking about how I can convince you of the accuracy because I don't think we have time. Um, but it's, uh, I, I'd encourage you to read the paper and get a little bit of the, the idea. This is what some, I believe, some known truth data that it just again shows you that you, you really do get a nice alignment um, when you use Callisto, that it's not just fast, but it's also quite accurate. Um, what goes along with Callisto is the second piece of software called Sleuth, where the statistical analysis takes place in the visualization. And there, what's happening is you are actually calculating the variance, the biological variance, and, and, and making some linear models where you're able to subtract and differentiate the biological from any other types of variance, and then actually do the statistical tests that allow you to try to say um, that one, exp one transcript is present and abundant at a higher level than another. Um, this slide could have come earlier, but yeah, it's talking about these transcript compatibility classes. So uh, I can go into that with somebody later if we have more time at the end, but it's just the way of counting and, and binning those counts that allows you to really have speed up. Okay, uh, I saw there might've been one question. So let me see if there's anything I can say or if I have to keep moving before I actually show you some of this. Okay, um, Tara asked a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, does this rely on the reference genome annotation being very high quality? Yes, it does. So it will work better if your reference genome is very well annotated. And if it's not annotated, you're not going to find it with Calista. I think I have a slide summarizing that. And then pseudo-align, it's a Kamer based uh, Lolong asks, um, you're aligning your reads, uh, but you're, you're actually aligning Kamers of reads, uh, if that helps you answer that question. So how does, bulk uh, how does this work in Cybers? Well, the very first step is not a, our, an analysis step, but you're gonna wanna upload your data to Cyverse, and I'll show some of these steps and then you know, sort of take you through. Uh, there's a tool called Cyberduck, which allows you to sort of uh, log into Cyverse, and it's almost like Dropbox. You can upload you know, 100 gigabytes of data in about 30 minutes. You just drag and drop that data. Or if you're using a server and you're used to working at the command line, you can go to iCommands, I'll show you the documentation. In the discovery environment, which I'll show you, you can go ahead and do the quantification. And then from the discovery environment, you can launch an RStudio session where I have already uh, loaded up the tutorial so that you could see how it works, okay? Um, so I mentioned, and I'll summarize that, and I'll go into actually show you those pieces that you know, um, pseudo alignment is fast, um, but as Tara anticipated, um, there are reasons why you might want to opt for other methods if you're trying to discover novel isoforms that are incompatible with your sequencing format. Um, if you're looking for SNP and variation discovery, that, that's probably not something you're going to capture here. Um, 
and some things that you might be a little bit less successful with Callisto um, capturing than, than you might be with some other uh, software um, things. Um, finally, we're going to visualize everything. Visualization is always important. I always use the ASCOMS quartet. These data have the exact same mean and variance and correlation and linear, you know, all those things, but you can see visually they look very different. Um, if you look at those base statistics, I always like this GIF. Each one of these uh, visualizations have the same means, the same standard deviations, the same correlations, but visually they look very different. So you don't want to cherry pick your data by not visualizing it, and that's what we'll be able to do once we go ahead with us with Sleuth. Okay, so let's go ahead in the last one third that we have here and um, show you a little bit of this happening. And uh, let me see, answer some questions quickly. Can uh, Callisto estimate the expression of repeated sequences in genes? Yeah, if you have transcriptomes and things that are expressed, you will get, be able to do that. Now, even though those DNA are repetitive, there's an algorithm, the expectation maximization algorithm that tries to sort of fairly align um, reads and split them up between things, multiple transcripts, which look very, very similar. So you can still get some level of estimation even in repetitive situations. Um, can you do data with multiple or organisms? If you have, if you just go ahead and concatenate your transcriptome, I think you should be able to do that. And how many KMERs are used? Well, the KMER size is up to you to choose. Usually the default is 31. I don't know if I've answered your question. Um, and usually actually it turns out that you just need the first and the last KMER of the match to see if, you, if it's gonna be a match or not often. And then you only continue matching KMERs if the first and the last one don't un unambiguously map. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up the discovery environment and start sharing that so I can give you a little bit of a clue. All right, so, oh, I first I wanna actually open up the learning center. Um, because we're short on time in, the, in so to speak, um, this is gonna look even more like magic than it normally might look because I'm kind of going at a, at a pretty fast clip but rest assured that everything is really documented. So if you go to tutorials, this is at learning.cybers.org. If you didn't get that, learning.cybers.org, it's linked from everywhere. And um, if you see there's RNA-seq with Callisto and Sleuth, and assuming I didn't mess up the links when I updated this the other day, it's all there. So every step that I, I, I can do is all there. Let me quickly guide you through them just so you have an idea. First, there's a sample data set that this tutorial is built with, which is some Arabidopsis data, where we actually have two different, um, you have geno two different genetic backgrounds and two different treat, or a different, and also an experimental treatment. So you have a knockdown and you also have hormonal treatments in this study design. Um, but if you wanna work with your own data, you follow the data store guide. And within five minutes, you can start uploading your data to Cybers if you haven't done so. The second step of doing this, it really is almost like magic because it's not a long workflow, is that you need to get an example, you need to get a transcriptome. So in this case, it's a Arabidopsis. So I went to um, Ensemble, but what you need to do if you are doing this with any organism is go to your choice of database, Ensemble or some other database and go ahead and find the transcriptome and, down and download it. Um, well, actually you can import it. So from here we have the cDNAs and in Cyverse, I would right click to sort of get this link, copy this link location. And then back in Cyverse, if I open up my Cyverse data store and let's say I had a folder, I could go ahead to the data store. I could say, you know, new data window. Well, actually I wanted a new folder, <laughs> sorry. I could go ahead and create that. Let's do it, a uh, new folder. And I can say transcriptome test. This is all covered. I'm, I'm going even deeper than I think I have to because I think it's well documented and we'll, we'll have time for questions. Finding this is gonna be the most uh, difficult thing, but in that folder, I can say upload and import from URL and paste in that and then import that. Now I would also wanna import my FASTQ files and then if I go to apps, applications, there are a whole bunch of applications. Maybe I need to do FastQC, or maybe I need to do Trimomatic to sort of do some quality control. 
and any of those applications are there. I'm gonna only use one application today just to show you how it looks, but all the applications are in wrappers that are, make them easy to use. So once you have, oops, I'm skipping ahead too far. Once you have um, a transcriptome, then the next step is to use an application uh, use the Callisto application and the Callisto application only does the quantification. So I can actually, I can literally click on this button and it's going to open up the application in the discovery environment. And I'll do this using the sample data. So it opens to where I was, but then it opens an application. So this is what an application looks like in the discovery environment. I can uh, give it a name. I could say this is a webinar demo of Callisto. And then um, I've got input data. So it says, where's your transcript? Uh, transcript? I'm going to browse. It's opening to the last place I opened data. So that should probably, I think, be pretty close to where it needs to be. OK, I'm going to select input transcriptome. So here's my Arabidopsis transcriptome, FASTA file. Then it says, are this paired or single end data? This happens to be paired end data. And then I would go ahead and click add. This actually takes longer than I'm, I'm going to let it do because I need to go into my, um, my FASTQ files. And in this case, here are the FASTQ files. And I would need to select, in this case, it, it wants just the right files and then the left file. So I could go ahead and do R1, R3, you know, I have to select all of my left end files. And I would say, okay. And then I would continue um, here with the right files. There are very few options, but you could decide to have some bootstraps, which increases your ability to find variants or to characterize that variance and visualize it. Um, if you're using single end reads, you need to give it the fragment length and standard deviation of that length. But then you press launch analysis. I'm gonna go ahead and open one that I've done previously. Um, I think, let's see, this one I did yesterday. So um, you might have, I did that a little bit quick, but the analysis button back here opens a history of everything that you've analyzed. And then when I click on the name of that analysis, it brings me to the location where that data is located. And because I use that data as my setup data, it's actually not gonna be there. <laughs> I've moved the folder. So what you're gonna get out of that is actually the data that is already open and public to you in the uh, Cybers training folder. So tutorials, Callisto, and uh, you're gonna get this output. And for every single pair of reads, you are going to have um, you're gonna have a folder, whoops, this is the, uh, the wrong place. You're gonna have, you're gonna have if, if I get to it or not, um, a folder which has the quantification data for each pair of reads. So let me try one more time to see if I can get to the right place. Training. Yeah, you're gonna get a folder for each one of your pairs of reads. And each one of those has a quantification in abundance. And if you open up this TSV file, you will have um, an abundance of things. I looked through the pre-survey, by the way. Um, somebody asked, how do you create a BAM file? And though there, I, I, this is an empty one that's here. There is a check mark that allows you to create what they call a pseudo BAM. So if you wanna use a BAM file for some reason, you have that. But here for every transcript, I've got the length and I've got the number of counts and I've got a normalized count of counts in transcripts per million. I'll come back to questions in a moment, but I just wanna get through this next five minutes and then I'm, I've shown you what I need to show you. So once you have that data, what you can then do is there's another application um, in apps called R Studio Sleuth. So if I search for Sleuth, <clears throat> Uh, that's actually in the tutorial, right? So you could go ahead and the follow the tutorial and then click next and it's going to say, hey, you should be using now Sleuth. And you can click on the button to open Sleuth, which is quicker than what I've done there. I got a lot of DE windows open. Let me close some of these windows. And in the Sleuth application, um, once it loads, it's just going to be asking you for 
the FASTQ files. And it's going to be asking you for something they call a study design file, which I describe and which is in the documentation. And that file is a TSV file that has just columns of your sample names and also the conditions. So you would complete, um, you know, you'd have to browse, whoops, you'd have to browse for the notebook um, that I suggest if you want to start from the notebook. Let's see if it will remember. It's close to where I want to be. So here is my Sleuth notebook. And then the data sets are the outputs of the Callisto quantification. So that's this folder, 03. Um, I, I'm selecting not one of these folders, but if you look on the left-hand side, I'm selecting that whole folder of folders. And then the study design is a TSC file. And I give you an example one, and it's also provided you know, in the documentation. I'm going to select that one. So when I click on that and click launch, it's going to launch an RStudio session. It might take a few minutes to launch uh, in order to have the data you know, copied into that session, but you'll get a notification and you'll click the link and then you'll be able to access that. Uh, when you do access it, I've already got one running here. So here's RStudio. I'm actually going to go right to the top. So this notebook tells you step by step. Um, all of the things that are that you might do to do the analysis. So this is a great starting point if you've never done this analysis and it's based on some tutorials that they've provided. Um, and if you don't know R, what you do is for every one of these green buttons, it's a little chunk of code. So you run that code, like we're checking that we've got Sleuth and we are loading um, the, the, that version. We're loading some libraries. Um, the thing that you'll need to maybe adapt is there are some folder names here when you launch our studio, it's automatically because you did that um, launching, you're going to have your results already imported. So they're, they're in the session, which is a bit separate from the data store and the Kalista. So you may need to make sure that these names and, and file paths match. But what you get, this is the first example of it, is uh, here is our, uh, this little file that we created where you have the listing of your different pairs of reads. Here we can see the, the genetic variation, wild type, or different alleles. And then here we've got mock or treated with a BA, abscisic acid, and then the file path. Um, those data are loaded. And then we go to Ensemble using something called Biomart. And from Ensemble, we can go ahead and choose PlantSmart. And then we can say, we want to bring over some gene features because the names of the genes right now are something like AT, 1G, blah, 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 blah. But you might say, and as we do here, bring over the transcript ID, the ensemble gene ID, the description, the gene name, all of those things you can bring over. So you would you know, run each one of these piece chunks of code and then you'd bring them over. Um, they're explained. Now, a few of these take a minute or two to run, so I've already run them. In this one, you're prepping um, all of those data for the statistical analysis, but you can then easily draw some plots. So here are some um, PCA plots that help ask questions about, you know, for example, batch effects is everything. Uh, soups, my phone, not my timer, although I'm already over. Uh, but we'll we'll finish up in two minutes. Uh, you could look at these PCA plots to sort of look are you know things filtering out the way that they should, or for example, if you have really strong batch effect, is replicate one from every single um, condition group grouping by itself versus grouping by the condition group it belongs to. Those are some quality control things. And they're all explained here in a little bit of detail. So um, you can also see a gene by gene um, expression uh, number of counts according to your different samples. So these are drawn for you without very much um, for you to fill in and customize, but you're welcome to do that. And you don't have to know a whole lot of R to do that, but it might be useful if you don't use R to sit, have someone sit with you. The best thing at the end is that you can go ahead and launch this interactive Shiny application. And with the Shiny application, then you can actually go through and play quite a bit more. So first thing I might want to look through is the test table, where I get a listing of all of my genes. And now I pulled in from Ensemble the gene description, so I know a little bit about what that gene might be, if there's a putative function for that gene. And I get the idea of the, the, the significance value, the expression, all of those different things. And I can sort and filter and download this. Um, if I have a particular gene, 
that I want to see a, 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 um, an analysis for. I could say that I want to do gene view and put in that gene name, and then I can instantly draw some plots. Well, we'll see how instant it is. Yeah, so here are my plots. And it's that bootstrapping, which gives me a little bit of the uncertainty around that plot, when that bootstrapping option that I showed you a while back. But you can draw those plots. You can get summaries. Um, here's our design matrix, but I think also, what was I looking for? Um, you can look for things. I didn't do the, um, you can look for, you know, things like uh, variance and over dispersion. You really, you know, so there are a whole bunch of things. And I think you, you'll need to look at the sleuth uh, documentation but it's a wealth of things. And I went through that super, super fast, um, but it really is almost a three-step process of run, um, you know, get a QC or get reads that you find are reliable and then run the quantification using Callisto. There's actually two steps that the app does, which you don't have to know right now, but it does an index of the transcriptome for the lookup table and the hashing, and then it goes ahead and does the quantification. And then finally, you move that data set into Sleuth, and you can do that in our studio session right in Cybers. Um, so there are a whole bunch of questions. That's the presentation. I would encourage you to go back to learning.cybers.org and run through that tutorial. This video certainly would be enough to get you started. And with that, I'm going to take questions that I see and answer as many as I can until I'm cut off. Um, so the question from Leo, I think, was answered by Tina. Um, Dr. Washington asked the question about how many samples can you do in a Callisto workflow. I don't know what the limit might be to that. Uh, so I don't know if it's unlimited, but I think I've not seen anybody stop. Um, Callisto, does, uh, she does make a good point about which version of the apps are actually, you know, able to use. What should I use? So if you notice in the way that I did it in my tutorial, I've linked to specific app versions that I want you to use. So you can trust those. Um, actually, I should not share this. I should share the um, tutorial. Uh, let's go back. Back on the tutorial. Sorry, they look similar, which is why I got confused. Um, back on the tutorial, you'll notice at the very beginning of the tutorial, oops, I'm opening things I don't want. At the very beginning of the tutorial, it tells you the versions and the names of the apps that, you, that this tutorial uses, so I can tell you that they work myself. Uh, and these links take you exactly to that app. So there's no danger if there's other, there are other Callisto versions and you may not want to use those, um, but there's no danger of being misled. Other questions? Okay, uh, Callisto aligns. Uh, so Callisto does the pseudo alignment and it does counting, but it doesn't do the comparison. So the actual differential expression or differential abundance happens with the sleuth where you do those, those modelings and you model the variance and you then get an idea that's co corrected um, of what the expression or rather the abundance would be. Um, Andres asked the question, if you want to do this on your own computer, what memory and power? A normal laptop would actually be enough. That's one of the efficient things about this. So you can actually do, this was designed actually to be able to run on a laptop. The advantage of Cybers, besides having everything installed, uh, I think is the data storage, because maybe you do have several hundred gigabytes of data that you want to move across. And also, if you want other people to collaborate and, and work on that data, it's in a space where other people can access it perhaps a little bit easier. Um, so um, Manoj asked FPK. I think you're talking about one of the normalizations. So there are different ways to normalize your data. The way that Callisto reports it is in transcripts per million. Um, so I don't know if you could go backwards and do a different normalization just from the count data that it gives you. I don't think you could do that, but maybe somebody's written a tool that does it. And so I don't know the answer to that one. Um, can you do, yeah, there are, Karen asked the question, can you do DE analysis with something other than Sleuth? Yep, there are other tools on the discovery environment. And if there's not a tool that you'd like there on the right hand side of the discovery environment, it's a little chat button and you can always ask us and get some help. Um, Adrian, Dr. Washington, you ask about checking for good alignment. And I think what you might be asking, um, let me see if I can pull it up, an example of this, is you do get some uh, statistics at the end of your uh, quantification about how well things mapped. Um, I didn't show that. I'm looking to see if this will load. Give me a second. Um, 
you know, you definitely want to see that the pseudo alignment rate of your reads to, to a transcriptome is high. Um, so I'm thinking you're looking for 70 or 80 or 90%. Obviously, not every single transcript is expressed in every single tissue at every single time point. So you don't necessarily expect a, a 100% result, right? Um, you would expect that um, if you're getting a very, very low alignment rate, that there could there's a chance that there's, there's something wrong that there's an error somewhere, but you're expecting, I would think somewhere higher than 70. Um, I'm just looking to see, I'm looking at these tables. I don't remember where the one that you're looking for, that you were asking about. Um, there is a summary table, I'm not sharing my screen yet. There is um, in, in one of the, it's just not loading for me I because I am uh, a little bit scattered and trying to find it. But you do get a pseudo alignment summary that tells you what that rate is. And so you can check that it's one of the files, but the example one I wanted to load is not loading. Um, is Sleuth compatible? Wait, so let me see if I've skipped anything. Would it be useful for a new organism to first do with PacBio? Um, hmm. Uh, if you're looking for an organism where you don't have a lot of the resources and you know, you're, um, I think PacBio is great because you could use something like ISOSeq and then really get uh, the knowledge of what the transcriptome really looks like because you're gonna get full length transcripts. So, I mean, if you can do PacBio and you have that money and you know, you wanna really get some good resources for something that there's not a lot of data it can be really useful. Um, is Sleuth compatible with Salmon? I've never done it. I believe that some people might have taken um, Salmon data and, uh, and used some of the Sleuth tools. I just not have done it. So that's a Google question to find out. Um, when you ask the question about can you combine things like DESeq2 and EdgeR and stuff like that, um, I wouldn't say necessarily, you know, some the quantification parts, there's not, it's not a matter of compatibility because you they would be redundant, right? But you could do them in parallel and see if they give similar answers. Um, but yeah, people, lots of people are asking questions about how do you, you, could you combine some of these things? And I would certainly first make sure I run workflows, um, in the way that they were designed and run them parallel side by side to see if I'm getting similar results. And then I would certainly Google or even talk to some of the people who use them in, in that way to see, um, uh, if there's any benefit to going, leaping between them. I do, um, I think I tried to answer before Leo the question of working with more than one organism. And as long as you have a transcriptome that represents both your parasite, let's say, and your host organism, you should be able to do that. Um, you can also, um, you can do some bacterial um, sequencing. Um, I have not done it, so I can't speak to how well it does work with Callisto, but I do know um, Jacob. Um, so we're at 148. So we can take maybe one more question. Um, and I don't know how much of this will be make it onto the recording, but hopefully that people were able to get a lot out of what we were able to say so far. Jason, why don't you take one more question and then we'll end since- yeah, um, Two more we'll because ask. the other one, okay, I'll take yeah. two. All, All right. right, after FRASQC and Trimomatic, um, you don't need to merge the paired end reads. You just, you just give them, once you've done the, the, the Trimomatic step, you still have, um, the reads are synchronized, um, but, you, but, but you, 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 you never need to merge them. You can load them straight as they are. As far as my last question, which is the perfect fettuccine Alfredo, the secret is always the pasta water. So there should be absolutely no cream that's not to be used in a fettuccine Alfredo. Uh, you really just wanna have, I, I recommend using a grater, a box grater to get that fine crumbly um, Parmigiano Reggiano or Pecorino, whatever you're using. Uh, should be parmigiano and that with some uh, into the pasta water with some butter and you just use that and really emulsify and note and use that and uh, to make the sauce and you'll have the perfect fettuccine every time see what i said he always has the perfect thing to say so that you know he's on top of the situation awesome. well thank you jason that's fabulous and thank you Great. everyone for all the questions wish we had longer but yeah <laughs> well, we can follow up next season with, with more. Um, as I mentioned, we'll post this video on our website, and we also have more than 40 other webinars that are, we've organized into playlists on different topics so that you don't have to filter through everything. So if you're specifically interested in 
genomics file manipulations or RNA-seq, go, go onto our website and look at the playlist. So thank you everyone for attending. We're gonna be on winter hiatus till late January when we'll start a whole new series of free webinars uh, to help you do your science using cybers. And happy holidays, everyone. Thank you, Jason, and everybody stay well. Thanks everyone, bye. Lots of thanks for you in there. I see, thanks everyone, yeah. bye, take care.